Good morning. Good morning. I'm all steamed up, so you're all foggy to me. <laughs> I have another mask that I like a lot better. That um, with people that wear glasses, you can see better. But anyways, good morning and welcome. So if I could direct your attention to the um, news about the church, um, we have a few. Um, trunk or treat will be Saturday the 31st. It's hard to believe we're the near the end of October. Um, the Enterprise Circle is collecting donations for new Christmas decorations. Two cents a meal will be collected on November 15th. Thank you to those who have signed up for the monthly community dinners. We need just a few more spots filled on the sheet. Please consider volunteering and sign up on the sheet in the narthex. Now, if I remember correctly, maybe Hope or somebody could um, verify for those that may be interested, um, is that the expense is incurred by the church for the supplies for the dinner mm -hmm. um, some of the time, right? If you're interested, right? Yep. Okay. Um, Important ways to stay in touch um, are on the back side. Are there other announcements to share? Phyllis. There's a jar in the back for the collection of the decorations. Okay. Um, there's a jar in the back for the collection of the decorations for? Okay, for the Christmas decorations. I just wanted to verify. Thank you. Are there other announcements? Yes, hope. There's still time if you have a college student that you would like to have included in our care package send out. I, um, I haven't shopped for it yet. I'm hoping to do that this week and then put the boxes together next Sunday. So adding a few names isn't going to change the amount of uh, cookies I buy because I'll eat what's left over. So <laughs> feel free to add some names. Yes, um, and that is also one of the announcements about Hope was sharing. Um, we typically, every year, um, we send out to college students, especially probably in this day and time with all the many restrictions and um, limitations, they would probably be grateful to receive. But if you know of any college student, it doesn't have to be a relative, a friend, um, you know, um, please include their name and contact information. And we send a little goodie back packages out to them, um, to their, right to their um, um, college address. So. Are there other announcements? Okay, thank you. Good morning. Let me get wired up here. Am I on? Oh, yeah, I am. Well, the first thing is, wow, that 10 months went fast. <laughs> it's been a delight to be with you all, and I'm looking forward to hearing how you enjoy Jake uh, as your interim. I think that it's a great move you're making and that he's going to lead you through um, some transition work that every church has to go through as they are starting out looking for another pastor. It's been a joy to be with you, and I thank you for the privilege of having been able to be, be with you. So um, let me open us in prayer. Holy Spirit, you guide us. You have poured yourself out upon the church in so many different situations, under so many different stressors. And we are again at that place where we look particularly to you for guidance and nurture and protection and transformation. We come to you and we open our hearts in worship. We lift them up unto the Lord. We ask that we are nurtured and chastened and transformed so that we might go forth from this place carrying with us your presence 
a light into a dark place, the power of Jesus Christ in our world, the coming of the new kingdom. Bless us in our worship, we pray. And all that we do and all that we are, we give to you. Amen. Please stand for the call to worship, if you're able. <coughs> Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The first hymn is in the red, number 38. Amen. We have two beautiful voices. Um, welcome, Barb. I heard yours. Welcome back. So nice and healthy and strong. And Charlotte, um, not only for your voice, but we are all going to miss you. Thank you for everything that you have done. Um, I know it's been a lot to juggle, probably um, longer than what you had expected, but we are all grateful. Thank, Thank you so you. much. So the unison prayer of confession if you could join me, please. Heavenly Father, you have brought each one of us out of our land of bondage, up from the Egypt of our sins. You have shown us what it is good and led us to a place where we may see your divine plan for all of humankind. You have shown each one of us the path with your word as a lamp unto our feet. We confess that even so, we stumble, go astray, fall short of our own deepest desires to live faithfully, and yet you are quick to forgive and lead us home to your welcoming arms. We confess we have sinned in so much of what we do, 
and what we leave undone. Forgive us, we pray, and help us follow you, learning and growing according to your word, strengthened by your Holy Spirit, until we stand before you and hear, we pray. Well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we ask this all. Amen. Let us offer our prayers in silence. Lord, it is not a small thing that each week we come and are able to unburden ourselves to you. Not that you aren't aware, not that we aren't aware, but Lord, help us to recognize that in confessing our sins, in bringing them to you, the most important thing is that we are able to leave them with you. We lay them down. We don't carry them anymore. And we receive your forgiveness, which you have promised us. In all that we do when we leave undone, we ask that you look upon our hearts and our intentions and that you continue to cause us to grow by your Holy Spirit in your way to be the children of God we were intended to be. And on all of this, we come before the Father in your name and pray. Amen. Know this, if you confess your sins, you are forgiven. God is faithful. He will absolutely separate you from your sins as far as the east is from the west. You put them down, you don't carry them out the door with you again. The first lesson is from the Old Testament, Leviticus 19, 1 through 2. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to all the congregation of the Israel, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 15 through 18. You shall do not injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go up and down as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand forth against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason with your neighbor, lest you bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The second gospel lesson is Matthew 22, 34 through 46. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend on the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David, he said to them. How is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I put any thy enemies under thy feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from what that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the name of the Lord. Thanks be to God. been having technical difficulties all morning. As a matter of fact, as I was getting ready, when I was finishing my sermon, which I do on Sunday mornings, I get up quite early. Anyway, um, <laughs> half of it had disappeared, <laughs> at least the first part of it, the introduction. So I think I can take that as a direct intervention of the Holy Spirit on your behalf. So I went uh, to finish my sermon this morning, as is my want, only to find about a page and a half of it, of my introduction, just gone. Uh, it is one of the many ways God tells me to shut up and stop being quite so full of myself. And it was an eloquent and lovely introduction uh, in which I led you gracefully through a reflection on the essential elements of life, the five molecules without which no life is possible, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, and oops, phosphorus, I guess that's six. I was using this to open my project to tell you that I think the same is true in our moral universe, our periodic table of elements that form the building blocks for all moral life, in fact, all human actions. That essential element, that essential ingredient, I believe, is trust. See there, I squeezed all the good stuff from a page and a half into a paragraph. <laughs> trust is the one thing without which we simply cannot navigate life. We must trust that the lessons we learn and the laws we observe are constant and reliable. We must trust that we're in the hands of a benevolent caregiver if we are to learn that our needs will be met, that the world is generally a reliable place, that we can ultimately control the environment because trust creates predictability. It is axiomatic, it is true, that our relationship with reality depends upon our conviction that what we see and hear and touch and taste is as it appears when we lose our moorings, become unable to discern reality, or are fooled by our perceptions, we are lost. Dementia is ranked according to dimensions of orientation. Is the person oriented to time, place, and person? Do they know what time it is, the day, the date, the season? Do they know where they are, what city they inhabit? what count, uh, country they hail from, and do they know who they are? Are they grounded in self-awareness? It is no accident that the ancient Hebrews were so very concerned that God, the one true God, the great I Am, was reliable. Each time they doubted and grumbled, it did not go well for them. Over and over again, they had to learn the lesson 
that it was God alone to whom they must turn, that not only were they utterly dependent upon God for their well-being, but that God was utterly reliable to deliver them into a place of well-being that God had promised. The foundational promise, the central premise, the driving force in the narrative of the Bible story is that God is providing for the people God has chosen, brought forth to know him and live in communion with his own self. God knew them in their mother's womb, numbered the hairs on each head, and was absolutely and perfectly reliable to act according to his personal integrity, which was indisputable. God cannot be other than whom God is. The overarching conflict that moves every story forward is ultimately one of trust. In whom shall we trust? Now, I'm not going to comment about the political hot button of our coinage, but if ever anyone should have had in God we trust emblazoned on their coins, it was the Hebrew people. And as Christians, it ought to be on ours too. Because in the framework I laid out for you almost a year ago, 10 months, there are three things we must know to navigate life. Who God is, and therefore who we are, and then what shall we do? How shall we then live in that knowledge? Any disconnect, any insufficiency in that chain of being is disastrous. If you do not have a clear picture of who God is, you don't really know God's character and personality as it is revealed in the whole testament of the scriptures. Know it in deep, in deep context that lays behind every story and illuminates every curious twist or turn, you will be traveling with a bad map, a wonky GPS that is not getting the signal. You will bumble and falter and get lost over and over again. You will have no moral compass to guide you, no deep and abiding confidence that you can navigate the challenges of life, no possibility of having the sort of perfect peace that passes all understanding in the times when everything does seem uncertain. Trust is essential in life, but trust is contingent upon performance. It is not enough to blindly trust someone or something that is untrustworthy. That is the essential challenge of discerning the true from the false, the real from the counterfeit, to assay the gold and reject the fool's substitute. I think I must say I believe there is nothing more important in an adult's life than to live with an integrity that allows one to make difficult choices grounded in the deepest convictions to know oneself, know the times one is living in, uh, one is willing to be, uh, know the times when one is willing to be deceived and foolish and then turn back from those paths. Like the writer Bunyan described in Pilgrim's Progress, false starts and dead ends, perilous traps and dark places one navigates in the Christian life with trepidation, but one ultimately emerges into the light where holding fast to the principles and foundational truths guide us safely home. Now, I must tell you that I personally find trust to be an ongoing exercise. On the one hand, I'm told, I am inclined to be too trusting of people in certain circumstances, psychologically. I am wide open like two barn doors for someone wishing to put one over on me. That is not to say that I'm gullible. I don't think I am, but I am inclined to give the benefit of the doubt, sometimes slavishly, to my own detriment. I have been slow to recognize indisputable evidence that someone is not who they would seem, not what I might wish them to be, not capable of performing in a way that one might hope to support a healthy relationship. On the other hand, I am very distrustful. This will become apparent soon when I hop onto a gurney and am wheeled into the operating room. I once thought I had abandonment issues until I had my first major surgery. I quickly discovered it was not abandonment but control that bedevils me. 
I would be perfectly happy to have them do whatever procedure they want as long as they could do it with the local so I could be supervising them and telling them when they were <laughs> screwing up. After the surgery, I am fine. But the thought of relinquishing control, putting my clothes in a sack beneath the gurney, giving my keys to my companion, and laying back into the hands of perfect strangers gets to the heart of my worry center. Getting me into hospital for an operation is like taking a cat to the vet. Outside I may see an adult, but inside I have all four paws out, all claws extended, and I'm very likely to pee on you in the process as I try to squirm out of your grasp. So exercising trust at that level is a discipline to me, a struggle just like a child learning to float. The most counterintuitive thing human beings are confronted with, to just lean back and relax. But I'll think, no you won't, and besides I'm right here, my arms are beneath you, relax. And of course, after a few attempts, somehow most of us overcome our reflexes to thrash and flail, and we actually learn that we are buoyant. Who knew? Now, trust is much harder for some people to accomplish than others, especially if we were sub subject to inconsistent or inadequate caregiving. If when we cried in distress as an infant, we were consistently cared for promptly and well, if our needs were anticipated or met adequately, if we were not subject to the stresses that sometimes impose themselves upon human beings, like the children who are victims of conflict or witness war, or those who are displaced because of parental loss or disaster, acts of war, and other overarching conditions. Well, if we don't have those, we are a leg up on those who must reconcile their experiences with their desire and our human need to trust that life is predictable and controllable, mostly, and that there is a benign, if not benevolent, person or force that stands behind all that is. If we were exposed to a parent or caregiver that was unreliable, as is inevitably the case, with people that struggle with addiction or often mental illness, or even if we were left to the tender mercies of someone who had not themselves received adequate parenting and so had little idea of how to do it differently, I know you've watched those families in the local supermarket with a disciplinary style that made you wince or even a dog being mistreated or abused by their angry, impatient, or brutish master. Well, if we were unfortunate enough to have had that as our base, we will struggle. We will have been deeply imprinted with cynicism about the reliability of life that will make it harder to give ourselves in loving relationships or receive love that is genuinely offered. And if we travel very far through life with such a distorted lens, we will repeatedly pay a tax for that handicap. But one of the most transformative things that we are given in our faith is a reset on our deepest impressions and proclivities, our biases and our habits of being, one that wipes clean the lessons of the past and asserts with absolute certainty that the one you have encountered, the one you are embracing is absolutely unlike anyone you've ever known, is in fact the Son of God, the God who extends a loving heart to each of his creation and beckons us to draw near and live in harmony with himself. Our ideas of God are important tells to our own understanding of so many things. If you experience God as gracious, gracious if, if, loving, uh, if righteous, sorry, if you experience God as gracious, if lo righteous, loving, if strict, per a parental model, you must, you almost certainly had a child in which at least one parental figure was solid and stable, mature, and balanced. If your early life was overshadowed by the vagaries of adults or those who could not get their act together, who raged or were erratic, self-absorbed, or unavailable, you will have a different learning curve to navigate 
in life and you will need to look for other models to follow if you are to grow past that predictive but real emotional and developmental handicap so in case i'm leaving any doubt i consider the attribute of integrity that is to say integration consistency unity of person and consistency of character to be perhaps the single most important attribute of the divine. And its absence is also an important witness to the ultimate nature of the one with whom you are dealing. Now, painfully, very early when I ran my own business, I learned that there is nothing more important than the character of the person with whom you are shaking hands. There is not a contract you can write that will protect you from someone determined to defraud you. And I know all of you in business can attest to that. You cannot do business with them because it means different things to them. When our promise to do something and is given and our word is our bond, you will move heaven and earth to fulfill that commitment. When they promise, they may mean that they will deliver. They may mean that they intend to deliver. They may mean that if everything is convenient, they'll deliver. But it may also mean that they will not have no intention to honor their commitment. Consider it a hoped for outcome, but not an absolute certainty. You cannot, so to speak, take it to the bank. So with all of this in mind, I would invite you to return to the Old Testament lesson and think about the implications of knowing God to be the gold standard for integrity, the one in whom we are to trust completely, the one in whose arms we may lean back and never, ever sink, because God is God's essential nature, God's character, God's very being, is that of one who is utterly reliable. Listen to the Old Testament lesson. Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. You shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, when you are tempted in days to come to privilege anything above that of integrity, I urge you not to. God is our witness that there is one standard in life and one way alone that leads to life. The many other roads lead to perdition, but compromised integrity is a bad bargain and you should never exchange expediency for short-term gains. There is one way to live before the Lord, and that is to be as whole and as integrated, as solid and faithful as God is. When presented with a shortcut or an equation that says that the ends justify the means for any cause, eschew it. It is not true. Like Jesus himself, our essential identity rests squarely on our ability to remember who we are and whose we are to whom we belong. If you know who God is, are clear and confident in that knowledge with the same certainty with which you know your name, you will know who you are and therefore how you must behave. When that is the case, you will know how you should then live. May this truth illumine your path, your path all the days of your journey. Amen. Will you join with me now in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It is time for us to share our joys and concerns and offer the prayers of the people. What's new? What's going on? I have some family joys that will stretch back into July when our son Mason married Whitney Hinspeter with a fabulous ceremony and service and everything. And stretching into last Saturday, where our son Quinn married Lisa Clemens with another fabulous ceremony and prompt and everything. So we have added two members to our family. Great. It's nice to hear positive things going forward. You know, everything sort of, you brace for the next news, and it's lovely to have good news. Congratulations on your tribe being increased. Others. 
Yes. Oh. Hang on. I'm having total hip replacement a week from Tuesday, election day. And unlike Charlotte, I don't want to be awake. <laughs> they can do their thing. Thank you. Others? Yep. I am most grateful for all your prayers. I have some uh, recovered from my surgery, my, sur my, my throat surgery, and I am able to sing again. Plus, my son, who had uh, COVID very badly, has, uh, after about five months, recovered and is back back at it. So there you go. So most grateful. Yay. Amen. Oops, oops, oops. Yep. Sure. Uh, I just want to share a huge thank you to our church family. Um, who brings us music, who brings us lights, who brings us heat, who maintains, who um, is here um, a lot. Um, and then those um, family members, church family members in the pews. So um, it's grateful and we are thankful um, each and every day. So thanks be to God. I'm not sure any of us will ever be quite as cavalier about the privilege of getting together in person to worship, at least not for a long, long time. It is one of those invisible gifts that you only notice when it's gone. I leave here and perform the funeral for Ruth Kaiser. And one of the things that was so notable about Ruth was she was a true church woman. She was one of the people that kept the Albion Presbyterian Church going seamlessly and uh, without, without so much as a notice. I'm grateful for the church and for all of the people that cause it to be able to carry forth its ministry. None of the jobs are unimportant. None of the jobs, may be, they may not be recognized the way they should, but they are crucial. Others? Yes, Charlotte. Yeah. I believe you're having a birthday. I am. I am. And we should see. Yep. And in my typical way, I'm celebrating it with the surgery. So <laughs> I've done this many times. However, the trouble is the COVID thing is putting, cramping my style because very often I've had major surgery up in Grand Rapids where I have my base, my friends. And so it was understood that there would be a party immediately following in which people would bring things that were clandestine, I mean clandestinely bring things in they weren't supposed to because who needs jello really? What I needed was banquette or possibly an eclair. Anyway, now with COVID I can have one person. What kind of party is that? So anyway, yes, I have a birthday and uh, and then I'm having surgery, and I am looking forward to the surgery like it's a uh, Norwegian cruise. You know, I can't wait. So. Happy birthday to you. Is this on? Hmm? Dave tells me I'm too loud usually. Um, a joy, we would like to say thank you again for all of them. It's been 10 months. That is crazy. The flowers on the altar are, are get well flowers for your oh, surgery. Thank you. um, happy birthday flowers. But then the congregation has also uh, collected a gift for you as a thank you. Oh. And we'd like to give that to you. So thank oh, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. Thank you. It. <laughs> I've really appreciated being able to be with you all. And it came at a sort of unique time in my life when there were a lot of other uh, things swirling around. But, um, but it's been a joy. And thank you for the privilege. Ah.
once i'm past hobbling around i may show up here to worship with you every now and then so but you're going to like jake so i'm leaving you in good hands ok any other prayers or concerns let's go to the lord and pray Lord, we look to you for so many things. And we forget to look to you for many things that we should turn to you. But in all of this, we know that you are our rock. You are our foundation. You are the still point in a turning universe. That whatever we are going through, any of us and all of us, you are there guiding us and protecting us and calling us to come to the place that you have prepared for us, which is always a blessing. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this congregation and all of the relationships that tie each other to one another by the heart. Continue to bless it. Continue to guide it. Minister unto them in this next phase of their journey and continue to prepare the person that you are going to call to lead them for a longer period of time. But in the meantime, I ask your blessing upon Jake and the leadership and the congregants. And I thank you for the privilege that you have given me of letting me abide with them for these 10 months. So Lord, we lift up all of the concerns on our heart and we give you praise and we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join with me in singing They'll Know We Are Christians, number 429. Yeah. 
Never forget that God is with you wherever you go. That God's love surrounds you. It goes before you and behind you. Like St. Patrick's vision of the Trinity. Above me, below me, to my left and to my right, before me, behind me. God surrounds us. And in all things, God is calling us to his own heart. So grow in your faith and understanding of that and enjoy the life that God has laid before you like a banquet. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and smile upon you. May the Lord give you his peace. Go forth to love and serve him and just celebrate the love of Jesus Christ in the world. Amen. Amen.